So I'm going to explain about art now. <laughs> I'm going to explain my sense of what, what trickster art is. First little story. At the beginning of Frederick Douglass's narrative of his own life, he says, well, I don't know how old I am. On the plantation, the slaves were not allowed to know how old they were. The white children knew how old they were. We reckoned our time by seasons. Uh, I was born in planting time or born when uh, in canning period or something like that. And uh, he goes on in this way, describing sort of the situation as birth and as seemingly, you know, that's the way an autobiography is supposed to begin. One thing that's happening there is he, he begins to invoke this double world, which on the one hand is the white world where people know time and have a calendar. On the other hand is this world that he grew up in where he's not allowed to know the time, not allowed to have. The white children know their ages. I don't know my age. You know, I live with the mother. I don't know who my father is. And the, the fathers are in charge in the white family. We don't know how to read. They know how to read. On and on. He has this whole set of, we felt at home in the night, and they are the day people or something. And, and one thing that happens is, the, the sort of the effect of this book is to begin to destroy this duality. Because one essential thing is, we don't know how to, the black guy is not supposed to know how to read or write or speak publicly to white people. And as you're reading the book, what's going on? you got this problem, because you're reading a book in which the black guy is reading, is clearly reading, writing, speaking to you if you're a white guy. And so it doesn't fit the, the situation. The whole, the whole design of plantation culture is based on a particular drawing of a line. And, and Douglas himself is the problem of this line. I'm very moved by this idea that the middle passage is not an accident. You know, that moment of lust where the white slave owner sleeps with the black slave woman. And the, the fruit of that is a guy like Frederick Douglass. <clears throat> and is he black or white? Somehow he's right on the line. And then, there's, then there has to be about 300 years of fighting to try to figure out where the, you know, how to redesign this world. Because it, it doesn't make any sense any longer. If the black man and the white woman or the white man and the black woman can have a child, then the division doesn't exist. So in a way, what Douglas's book does is to begin to destroy the, the plantation culture just by being there. So let me tell you a little story. This is from an obscure Scythian myth, but the, there's a little tiny detail in a, in a, in a uh, Northern European story that interests me. It, there, there's a, a guy who's sort of sp supposed to be perfected, and he's the hot guy, and he's the, uh, identified with the sun, and he shines, and he's radiant, and something like this. And then there's a trickster figure. And the trickster is always kind of irritated at this guy who shines like the sun. And the guy who shines like the sun is invulnerable. And so you can throw a stone at him, it just drops away. But the trickster figure finds out by certain disguises and sneaking around and everything that he has one vulnerable place, which is his knees. It's one place you can attack him. And so one of the things the other gods do is they throw this big spoked wheel at him and watch it drop away. And so a trickster comes along and he throws that thing and it hits him at the knees and the guy dies. Now the generalization that I want to try out on this is that if you want to kill an immortal, uh, go for the joints. <laughs> Attack it at the joints. Now, I'll do it in a different story, but it's the same story. The way that I know that story is that a guy, uh, there's a French man named Dumézil who wrote a book about Loki, who is the Norse trickster. And Dumézil finds this story and says, you know, that's a lot like Loki. The thing I like about it is it has the actual knee joint in it. Uh, so it's, you can see the image very clearly. But let me tell you a tiny bit about the Loki story, because it's the same thing. There's, there's a fellow in the Norse stories named Balder. And Balder is, again, a kind of a associated with the sun. Balder the good, they call him. He's, you know, he's a sweet guy. And, uh, but Balder begins to have disturbing dreams. And he's dreaming that he may die. And so he goes to his folks, his, you know, people, and he says, God, I'm having these upsetting dreams. And his mother, Frigg, says, well, 
you know, that's horrible. And we are going to try to, it's, it's just like the Raven series, we're going to protect you from all harm. You know, you're not going to die, trust us. So Frigg goes through the world extracting an oath from everything in the world that it will not harm Balder. She talks to all the stones and all, everything in heaven and earth that they, it cannot harm Balder. She takes an oath from everything. And then the same thing happens. The gods like to gather around for sport and chuck things at Balder. <laughs> so they take a spear and they throw it at Balder and he stands there and boing, it falls on the ground and they throw rocks at him and hit him with trees and kick him and nothing, you know, nothing will hurt him because everything is taken about. So of course this irritates Loki. You know, Loki, you know, right, thinks the tricks do. <laughs> so Loki disguises himself as a woman and comes creeping around and he talks to Frigg about this, you know, gets her to tell him. And Frigg says, yeah, I extracted an oath from everything in heaven and earth. Then Frigg says, there was one thing, the mistletoe. She says, it's so young and harmless, I didn't even bother to ask it. <laughs> so then Loki understands what to do. So he goes and takes him, you know, it's, the mistletoe is a, a parasitic green thing, grows up in the top of various trees, including the oak. And uh, a couple things about it, it stays green all winter. And uh, it becomes a great symbolic thing in these Norse countries because in the winter everything dies and all the oak trees are bare. And you look up and there's a little tiny piece of green up there. And it, it's like the spirit that goes through the winter and doesn't die. This old big book of Fraser's called The Golden Bow is all about this and uh, tries to find that image in a lot of different cultures. But anyway, so Loki goes and he gets the piece of mistletoe. You know, he shows up at this sport where they're chucking things at Balder and, 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 and kills Balder with the mistletoe. You know, it's the greatest disaster had yet happened to the Norse gods and they, and they get incredibly angry at Loki and, as, and they, uh, they uh, bind him under the ground, which unfortunately brings on the apocalypse, so, and there's a lesson in that. You can, if you try to tie up the trickster, you bring on a, a greater calamity. But the question then is, in this story, where is the joint? It's, it, it's a story again about somebody, this Balder is supposed to live forever and they're doing all this stuff and, and yet he dies. And so I want to say, Loki kills him by going for the joint. And where's the joint? Now I will tell you where the joint is. There are a couple joints in this story. And one is this business of where the mistletoe is. It, it's hidden in that phrase when Frigg says she extracted an oath from everything in heaven and earth. Well, where does the mistletoe live? <laughs> you know, it's up in the tree. It's neither in heaven nor earth. It's on this line between. It's at the joint between the two worlds. That's where the mistletoe is. Or the more complicated detail. This is actually an example of, of the... Uh, accidental find. I was trying to figure this out. I was I was in London one whole summer, and I I was in the British Museum, which has been mentioned this morning. I was inside this whale, and I was I've been reading these stories, and I was just wandering around, scratching my head, and I came around these uh, across these Fraser books, and there was one called uh, you know the Mistletoe or something. I went, Whoa! So I read that, and and then I began to understand that what the one detail that's important is this: in these Norse countries. And you got to understand, this is a country where the sun actually disappears, goes under the horizon, and leaves you in complete darkness for a, a period of the year. In these Norse countries, at Midsummer's Eve was the time that the mistletoe was gathered and, and uh, burned. And Midsummer's Eve is the moment when the sun turns mm -hmm. and goes in the other direction. And so the sun all summer long is rising higher and higher. Every day it's a little higher in the horizon. And it looks like, you know, you're in the promised land and Balder the good and the sunny is back and uh, nothing will ever die and uh, so forth. And then there comes a moment when the sun turns and starts going back down. And who, who in the world did that? You know, who made this happen? It's like somebody here said, uh, you know, this, this change of seasons up here. Who brings... At the moments when the season turns, who operates in that crack and uh, in that joint? And so it's as if time itself is jointed. It's in the joints of time that this trickster figure can enter. And um, that's where time is vulnerable. That's where the sun is vulnerable in this case, that the sun can begin to die so that Loki is able to kill Balder at, at, is it on Midsummer's Eve and then Balder has to, has to turn. Now... I kind of got into a whole thing about thinking about these joints then. It turns out the oldest 
that our word for art comes from the oldest Indo-European word for the joint. And we still have it, for example, in the word artisan. The artisan is a joiner. The artisan is somebody who makes things by jointing them, putting them together. And that's, there, there's a, or an artifice actually is a jointed thing, a thing made. We actually have it in the word articulate. It's, it has the same root. And the word articulate, of course, means being able to speak clearly, but there's an older meaning of it, which is, you know, an articulated skeleton is a jointed skeleton. An articulated being is a being that has joints. So like the arthropods, those are, are, those are jointed insects, the arthropods. So actually, the, it, I think that comes first, and then later comes the idea that language itself could be jointed. And so the articles in language, the V's and ands and buts, or the little elbows and finger joints in <laughs> sentences. <laughs> and um, <laughs> there's a wonderful thing in, uh, in Aristotle, he says, uh, he's trying to think about language, he says the dolphin is just like a human being, and it can make a noise like a human being. It makes a long moaning sound, but it lacks the organs of articulation, which are the lips and the tongue, and so it cannot <laughs> articulate its language. So that's wonderful. It's like the lips and the tongue make the moaning sound that is a human being into, break it into little pieces, give it joints, which are the distinct words. And uh, one thing I love about Ezra Pound's poetry is that he has a credible sense of the vowels, and you cannot read the poems without having your lips and tongue get really active, and it's all the, all the poems have wonderful jointing in them. So I began to think, well, in a way, to be an artist is to be a joint worker. Now, actually, I should say that most joint workers most are interested in um, making sturdy tables and chairs. And most of the old ancient language of artus, of artisan, has to do with making things that are firm and will not come apart. And actually our word harmony is from this same root. It's an aspirated, it's a, you go, and then you say ar, harmony, it's the same, it's the same joining work. And harmony is, you know, a, a, a beautiful jointing. And um, mostly what you want is for the music to be harmonious and the body to be harmonious and the universe and the government and all this stuff to be well fit and, and tight. In fact, if you break your arm, you want a joint there that's, that's tight. And that, that's the dominant meaning of this art stuff. However, what I'm interested in is the dissident meaning, which is the trickster figure who is interested in loosening the joints or doing something else with the joint. So they say Hermes is the god of the hinge. And uh, he's, at, you know, he's at the doorway, but what he does is it goes both ways. And so he's like the god of the elbow. He's the hinge joint. So then let me give you two different ways in which tricksters are joint workers. In my book I have three, but the third one I cannot explain here today because it's too long. But the, the, the first that I'll, I'll do I've already done, which is that the trickster is a joint worker in, in the situations in which he attacks the joint to kill something. So, you know, that's the kind of the gravest, scary, uh, potentially dangerous, death-involved, joint working. Somebody like, like Frederick Douglass, you know, he's in this culture, which I'm calling plantation culture, and it has, it has this whole system of joints, and it's articulated in a certain way, and people know how to behave, and where you're speaking, where you're not speaking. Douglass would like to kill it. <clears throat> and what he does is to go for the joint. He, he figures out all the places where the, this culture has divided itself, and he stands right in the middle, and he talks in a way that makes the, the articulation of that old world senseless. It becomes incomprehensible. He has a, wonder, he has a lot of irony in that book. There was, there was all this stuff in the Bible that they talk about... Uh, you know, the sons of Noah, and the reason there's slavery is certain people did something bad in the past, and that's the black folk, and then they're the white folks. And, and, and Douglas says, you know, as long as slave, as masters sleep with their slaves, soon slavery will become unscriptural. <laughs> that is, he says, soon in America, you're going to have to choose between the Bible and this institution. And, uh, you know, he's, he's right there, he's right in the joint. He says, you know, you, you, tried, you tried to, you know, the Bible you thought gave you permission for this, but then you went and slept with the slave woman, and now you've now you got a real problem on your hands. <laughs> so that's the first way in which 
tricksters or joint workers is this kind of destruction. Uh, and there's a lot to say about that, but I want to try to do the second one in the limited time. There's a book about these, there are all these hymns to the various Greek gods. And, and so each of them has a sense of boundary. And the god of war is not so interested in the god of love. Because, you know, it doesn't help if you're trying to kill somebody else. So you have this articulated system with a bunch of boundaries between it. And she says, but it cannot come to life until you got somebody who can cross all those boundaries and move around inside the whole thing. And that's why Hermes is the last one. It's like, it's like, if you, it's like the human body. We, are, we have these organs and uh, the heart and the lungs and the gut and the knees and the brain and everything. <clears throat> and each of them actually, if you look at them, <clears throat> has elaborate ways of protecting itself from the other. You know, the brain has a, a whole uh, membrane around it to make sure that certain blood doesn't get into it. It has to be separated. And yet the thing cannot come to life unless there are certain functions of boundary crossing where stuff can get across the boundary. You have to have both of these things. So actually, maybe there's a second image. One image is that the the, the trickster is an artist worker. In, the, in, this, in this business, it would be not to kill by going at the joint, but to keep the joint flexible or to make the boundary permeable. That there, ha there has to both be a boundary and it has to be permeable. And until you have both things, you don't, you don't get the th stuff to come to life. And one thing that is true about the trickster that is not, usually not seen is that the trickster wants the boundary there too. Uh, the, the trickster will insist on the boundary and if you think, if you try to erase the boundary, a whole other kind of disaster will come upon you and you will, you will realize that you have to have a boundary in certain situations. But then if the boundary becomes too rigid, the trickster will poke holes in it. Uh, actually, in terms of this ritual that we did yesterday, the place you see this function is the hoops and the opening of the road. <clears throat> there, you know, there are certain places where there are boundaries between everything, and then there also has to be passage between them. And if that passage got blocked, the trickster would come and figure out a way to get through it. If that tra passage were erased, the trickster would probably come and, and create a disaster, and you'd say, oh, apparently we need to differentiate these two things. So this is a figure who keeps an articulated world lively. And let me say a little bit fuller about this business of I said each of these guys has his or her turf. And I think the idea is that, in fact, they not only have their turf, but the impulse is to build the boundaries, make it firmer and firmer. And so without this guy, the articulated system will begin to fall apart into pieces. An example is this. Hades is the god of the underworld. His business is to keep the souls down there when they've died. And that's really what he wants to do. And so when he steals Persephone and takes her into the underworld, uh, it's a disaster on earth. And Demeter starts to mourn everything. And he, Hades, Hades, to follow out his nature, is never let her go back up. And if he could insist on his boundary, she would never return. And so that becomes, the, the world begins to die because this boundary is so stiff. And then the gods call on Hermes to go. And Hermes sweet talks Hades out of his wife. And it takes the trickster to do this. It takes somebody who can go across the boundary that somebody, some other god is, is interested in, in maintaining and can seduce the other character. <clears throat> or I like this little detail in Martine's story about um, when the boy has to leave the home, the, uh, he's stolen from the home. And you say, well, why couldn't he just, uh, the parents say, well, it's time for you to go. Well, the idea would be that the parent, your, your, the function of the parent is to protect the child and keep him in the home. You're not doing your parent job unless you do that. So to be the good parent is to keep the child in the house forever. You know, secretly you may wish the child to go, but if you're, if you're, doing, if you're doing the thing you're supposed to, if you're perfecting your function, the child will never get out. And so ritually what you do is you say, so a thief has to come. That's the only way to get the kid out is, uh, is to break the boundary. The, the other people are concerned to maintain the boundary and the thief breaks the boundary. And so maybe I want to give Robert some time here, but maybe I'll finish with the... It took me maybe eight years to try to come up with some I intuition into why the trickster has to steal fire and steal from the heavens. You know, having written a book called The Gift, I mean, into generosity and stuff, I thought, why don't the gods just give us this stuff? I mean, it seems, so, it seems like such a better world. Why, who are these guys that are so stingy that human beings have to steal? It really seems like a shame. Uh, you know, what is it about the gods that, that, that you've got to actually steal from them? 
one thing to say about the creation that Trickster makes that keeps the boundary permeable. A permeable boundary is an unusual image. It's it's a kind of connecting without connecting. Or they're stealing the kid. It's a way of going into the house without going into the house. See that? Or so it's a way of having contact without having contact. And I began to think, well, actually, maybe what's going on in this is that they're really, in these old stories, there really is a division between heaven and earth. And you cannot, to erase that division would bring some other kind of horrible consequences. Uh, there has to be this division. And yet you want some commerce across, uh, across that divide. Mm -hmm. And if it were gift exchange, if it were gift commerce, it would begin to erase the divide. You would begin to say, oh, I'm so grateful, come into my house, you eat my food, I eat you food, you know, we'll sleep with your women, your women sleep with our men, and so forth. And pretty soon you're not divided anymore. That can't happen either. The, 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 the cosmos cannot exist without certain very clear divisions. And so uh, theft is a way of having commerce without having commerce. It's a way of having connection without having connection. That's right. And some of the some of the kind of art or artist's work that tricksters make has this function in it. One example actually is the art of sacrifice. <coughs> the art of sacrifice, which in the, that story I told about Hermes, remember he steals the cattle and then he sacrifices a couple of them. Well, one of the funny things about sacrifice, uh, the way the Greeks do it, for example, is that <clears throat> it actually, the sacrificial uh, ritual reenacts the moment when the gods and humans were, were divided from each other. And yet, at the same time, it's, an, uh, it's a commerce between them. That is, you do the sacrifice to the gods, but the ritual itself is a remembrance of the fact that you are not the gods. They when, what does that mean, when the, uh, the moment when the gods and the humans were separated from each other? Well, it actually comes out another, in the Prometheus story. Uh, Prometheus, it used to be that humankind and the gods sat down at the table together and ate and so forth. There was a, there was a golden age when, um, and also we didn't die the way we do die now. Mm -hmm. And then Prometheus tried to get, there's a whole story about Prometheus, but, but it's out of that story in which Prometheus stirs the pot that sacrifice is invented also. Mm -hmm. and, and actually in the Greek sacrificial system it's, it's Promethean sacrifice that you're doing. And what you're doing then <clears throat> is simultaneously remembering the moment when Prometheus fucked up and, and, does, and, and caused the inexorable separation between humans and gods. And yet, as you do that memory of the disconnection, you are doing something that connects you with the gods. So sacrifice is <clears throat> it's a permeable joint or flexible joint art which uh, connects without connecting. So... I can go on this way forever, but why don't I, that's two ideas. <laughs> Should we talk a little, you know, we're going to run, yeah. what? Yeah, we're going to, we're going to one. Okay, well, we got some time, so why don't we talk a little bit? Good part. That's great. Uh, as I listen to you speak, it's because it's the first time I've, I've heard these, these ideas, but our political system has now being changed relative to our, our identified minorities, whether they be children, women, uh, black, Italian, whatever they are, it appears to me that the present political atmosphere is attacking the joint. And I guess what I have in my head is this vision that rather than the ideal that we've, at least I've kind of believed in since the inception of this country, but the idea is to bring us together in a cohesiveness, in which would then require flexible boundaries between these groups. Yeah. That what's going on, in fact, is maybe the opposite of that, and these groups are going to go <coughs> off. Into yeah, you can do a lot of that's that's good. You can do a lot of reading of the political scene in terms of this. Uh, where are the divisions, and who's interested in maintaining them? Who's interested in trying to erase them? Who's interested in trying to change the system so radically that it's, you know, there, there are apparently some people out there right now who say, you know, the Constitution itself was a mistake. There was an earlier government before the Constitution. Now, those are big joint attackers. Uh, and, you know, mythologically, that is a function to go all the way, you know, why? But similarly, yeah, the, uh, you know, one way you can build a political system is to create divisions among the group. You know, this whole business of attacking immigrants, that's, 
Actually, the, I, I, I read this stuff, you know, the people who want this amendment to protect the flag, that's like Bolt, uh, Frigg trying to protect Balder. Uh, yeah. It's like we have something called the United States, which is somehow going through some serious changes. And then some people come in and say, no, no, we're going to protect it from all harm. We're going to have one thing that nobody can touch. Well, of course, that's exactly where, <laughs> where, where we're going to have to go. And, um, and the problem is that uh, at a certain point, if you can't maintain the flexibility, if you're not allowed to burn the flag, then I think you bring on the apocalypse. So that's just my reading of it, but... There's <laughs> Frost to Hermes Poet. He says, something there is that doesn't uh, love a wall. Ooh. Something there is that doesn't love a wall. It wants it down. Yeah, except, you know, in that, in that uh, poem, there's two guys, actually. Yeah. yeah. I, w I would say it probably is a Hermes poem because it's, there's actually... He understands both sides of that. They're building the wall, but they also yeah. know that there's a great force for destroying it. And he invokes both of those. Mm -hmm. That's a good. And is there a kind of trickster art then besides the art of sacrifice? <coughs> yeah. Well, of course, because I'm writing this book, I think all art <laughs> is in this area. Well, I'll give you one other example. I think telling the trickster stories has this function. And so when somebody got up and sang the Homeric hymn to Hermes, they were doing a kind of joint work. And what goes on is, you know, my image of this is, you know, you're Greek, you're mostly in the Ap Apollo's world, worrying about the rules, mm -hmm. trying to have a life that doesn't fall apart. And uh, then you go to the festival, and you hear the bard sing the story of Hermes, and you go into a bit of a trance. And you dream of being a thief who farts at his older brother and <coughs> is, refuses to be intimidated by the mother. And, and uh, at the end of it, it's like a good trip to the chiropractor. All your, all your <laughs> interior <laughs> joints have been loosened up. <laughs> and uh, uh, the, you know, your, yeah, and the stuff begins to flow in your own. Actually, here's. Uh, a guy named Lopez Pedraza has a book about uh, Hermes, and the one thing I love in that book is he says, uh, if you're doing therapeutic work, <clears throat> you're having a lot of trouble getting the uh, the person comes in and depressed, and and uh, you know week after week nothing goes on, and finally the person has a dream that a thief is breaking into their house. Mm. That's right. And they say, oh, excellent now, because the problem is <laughs> that the ego is we always are defended. Uh, you can't get out, go through the world without being defended, but then some problem comes up that the solution to which is not inside your own fence. And you cannot move. And then suddenly the thief comes and breaks in. And then you say, well, what, what, what do you think the thief was after? And, and uh, so that, that, that dream would be a kind of. So uh, you could do a whole book, really, on the uh, trickster as someone who invades the ego and, uh, and gets over its boundaries. And brings yeah. New so. Let's see, in, in terms of flexible joints. You see, I think, I think m most good art has this function in it someplace. That in addition to beauty, there is always this other stuff that, that brings the beauty to life. You got an idea? Well, for me, the joint part of art is, is looking at art. Can, good art will give you a way of looking at the world differently. Yeah. And yeah. for me, that's where the joint is. Yeah, yeah. You know, or another way of saying this, I'm actually interested in uh, <laughs> in John Cage who does not make beautiful right. work but jo what John but what John Cage does is to is to really fuck up your your sense of hearing yeah. and <laughs> it, but the effect of it he quotes uh, one of his friend painters in New York the painter says you know getting people to see that's a lot and and you come into the world uh, you know we have uh, you begin to get a set way of seeing a set way of hearing a set way of speaking and how possibly do you change that? And you can't, there's certain situations which you can't change it based on its own inner logic. And something has to happen that is so, you know, one thing that Cage did was to say, now how do we make this distinction between noise and music? And th that, that's the trickster question. You say, here you've got a line, this is noise and this is music. And Cage says, well, you know, occasionally I hear something over here that seems like music to me. 
And, whoa! <laughs> you know, then, you, then, then this is a big problem for the, for the well, actually, it's, it's Duchamp does the same thing. Duchamp says, how do you know the difference? How do you know the difference between... <laughs> how do you know the difference between... Uh, well, they are here. <laughs> between high art and a piece of just the commercial stuff. And Duchamp goes into the marketplace and he gets this beautiful bottle rack that was made to just put milk bottles on. Mm -hmm. And he brings it and he puts it in the museum. <laughs> you know, and what he does, he says, there's a line here between the museums and the rest of the world. And I'm going to see what happens if I get something, if I manage to sneak something across and put it in the other, in the museum. And the museums have been in, in, in chaos ever since. Uh, so... That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking this.